Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for joining us here at this press conference. Also, a warm welcome to our audience in the webcast and live stream. Um, this is a wonderful panel joining us here today to talk about um, our planet, uh, the planetary boundaries and the living planet. Um, and I'm joined by a wonderful panel here. Um, uh, to my immediate left is Professor Johan Rockström. He's the director of the Stockholm Resilience Center. Uh, to his left, uh, Jan Eliasson, the Deputy, Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations. Moving further down the line, we have Hans Vestberg, the CEO of Ericsson. And uh, all the way to the left, co-hosting this press conference today, uh, Marco Lambertini, the Director General of the WWF. So, without further ado, I'm, uh, I'm moving on um, to uh, Johan Rockström. Um, he has, uh, five years ago, started the Planetary Boundaries Project, and actually tomorrow he will launch his new book, the news iteration of his findings there. We're very excited about that, and I would hand over to you and ask you to give us the key findings of your, of your research uh, uh, for our audience here. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> thanks, George, and, um, and um, uh, welcome, everyone. So this year's WEF is about the new global context, and um, I represent um, the global community of Earth system scientists that today stand on a vast mountain of empirical evidence to conclude from a scientific perspective that the new global context is really about recognizing that humanity has become a global force of change at the planetary scale. We can today, unfortunately, envisage the global world economy itself disrupting the stability of the Earth system. Now, to avoid that that becomes a doomsday predicament, science has now finally been able to translate this into a constructive new paradigm for world development, shedding off the old sustainable development paradigm, which, as you all are aware, is about economic growth and minimizing environmental impacts, to recognize that the economy must now develop within the safe operating space of planetary boundaries. And this Friday, we published in Science the latest five-year update of this research, where we have more robust evidence than ever before that the nine planetary boundaries that we've identified, including climate, but also biodiversity, how we manage land, water, fresh water, nutrients, chemicals, air pollution, and the stratospheric ozone layer, are fundamentally part of our ability to have human prosperity in the future. So that's one conclusion, that we stand on a very, very robust basis to say that we can today support business and policy towards a new paradigm for sustainable development. The second conclusion is that this is all about a transformation towards a new logic for world development. It requires a mind shift in terms of reconnecting human societies to the biosphere. And in this book that we launch tomorrow, uh, which is about abundance and development within a safe operating space, we make perhaps a surprising point that it all boils down to actually becoming wise stewards of the remaining beauty on Earth. The recognition that the living nature is key to our own world economic development and prosperity. And this has been done together not least with uh, world-leading national geographic photographer Matthias Klum, who happens to be in the room here, to connect science with the stories and empirical evidence that this actually makes case. My final closing remark is that this is a year, a decisive year for humanity that Jan Eliasson certainly will emphasize. We have the Climate Summit in December. What does the Planet Boundary Research tell us? It tells us that we need to stay within a planetary boundary on climate. The maximum planetary limit for that is 2 degrees Celsius. It translates to a science-based global carbon budget, which means that we have to decarbonize the world economy by mid-century. And this finite budget within a safe operating space needs to and can be shared in a fair way among all nations on Earth. And this is one example of how to operationalize this latest science. Thank you, George. Thank you. So over to you, Mr. Edison. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, I'm very glad to be with this panel. Uh, I have been professionally and personally engaged uh, in uh, contact with these uh, four people at this uh, podium. Uh, the only complaint I have is that my wife would complain about gender uh, balance here. But, uh, we, <laughs> Point I taken. Think we, we certainly uh, represent 100% of humanity in our striving for having a deeper understanding of uh, the uh, planetary boundaries uh, 
Johan and I uh, discussed this uh, some time before he published the famous article, and I think I can say that, and it was September 2009. Mm. And uh, <coughs> we thought that it wasn't it enough to have the problem with climate change, and then he added eight other parameters, and uh, he, will, uh, he, he, he will, in this book, which I've had a little preview at, uh, say that we have crossed four of the, uh, the these boundaries, which of course is a tremendously important uh, warning signal. And I would say that uh, this year is absolutely crucial for us to come to our senses, if I may dramatize it somewhat. Uh, we have three very important uh, international conferences, which in my view should serve as catalysts for action. There's one in Addis Ababa in uh, July, on financing for development. <clears throat> and uh, then there is one uh, in the end of September in New York, which is to be uh, uh, gaveling and deciding on the uh, sustainable development goals and setting the direction for the post-2015 development. I was around already back 2000 when the Millennium Development Goals were established, but we live now in a day and age with transformational uh, changes needed and a much wider uh, agenda. So the go goals are pretty many, but I'm sure that the uh, member states will present them in a strong and convincing and mobilizing way. Uh, they will serve then hopefully as a, a basis for planning, not only on the global level, but above all, I would say, on the uh, regional, national, and even in the best of cases, local. And I think we will make uh, extraordinary efforts to make these goals known and recognized. The uh, leading words are, of course, fighting poverty. Still, unfortunately, the <coughs> major uh, objective, but uh, just mention two other aspects. One is, of course, sustainability. Uh, this is uh, everything we do from now on. We should have done it much earlier. It has to be based on sustainability. And uh, we may have plan B in life, but we certainly have no planet B, <laughs> as you may have heard yeah. before. And then the other word is universality. This time it's uh, obligations for all member states. We are a global community, and uh, we should realize that we have to carry burden and we have to make contributions. But I, I would also not like to end on a doomsday note. I think this is also a tremendous opportunity an opportunity to really work in a new way. I have a sense that uh, organizations, uh, I have been foreign minister, I've been working uh, for a long time, but also in, in the UN, there is a tendency uh, to work vertically in silos. But if we, if we are to make progress in today's world, we need to, of course, be extremely good in our verticals <laughs> in the silo, but we need to work horizontally. Mm. And that's why I think this mm. panel is a pretty great expression here. We have science, uh, policy, uh, business, and uh, the uh, enormously important civil society and NGO. I want to pay tribute to you worldwide. I find you. what you have done uh, in order to mobilize uh, public opinion on these issues. And if we put the problem in the center and then ask ourselves who can do something about it, uh, then I think we can make a difference. And that requires us to work in a different way. And that's why uh, not only this panel is symptomatic of the kind of work that I would like to see, but also the World Economic Forum, of course, which uh, provides a marketplace, a, a meeting place for all of us to discuss uh, very serious things. And I think let's go to make this year really a year of action and uh, move in the direction of uh, taking responsibility <coughs> for the future of this planet. Thank you very much for this passionate call for action. Um, speaking of the business voice uh, in this matter, uh, I'm passing on to uh, Mr. Hans Vesberg, the CEO of Ericsson. Uh, <coughs> Thank you What's your perspective on the, on the issue? Thank you very much. And uh, first of all, of course, congratulating the, this uh, science work that is going to be published tomorrow. I think it has been a long work and very important work. And I think that for all businesses, science plays a very vital role because that is putting all the dots together uh, to conclude where we are and where we're going. And I think uh, uh, that's why I feel that uh, there are many challenges on Earth today. And of course, the sustainability is one of the largest we have. 
And it is a moment where it is very important for public private to come together. We're going to decide a lot of things this year and it's not going to be one organization that can solve this. And I think that the Deputy Secretary General here clearly expressed how important it is to work over boundaries. I think as a company, Ericsson, of course, we have our society goals uh, now for 2020. And I think companies are realizing how important it is to think about it. But I think also from a point of view from an industry. I represent an industry that is ICT, that is uh, all the broadband in the world, which is going to be deployed all around the world. We have clearly a commitment to work cross sectors right now to really work on the CO2 mm. emission. Mm. And we have a clear ambition and belief that we can probably avoid 20% of all CO2 emission in the world by 2020 by using the technology that we are pro providing as an enabler. But that's only as an enabler. We will need to work with transport systems, we need to work with different industries, and of course with the public sector to make it happen. Mm. We are committing, and I, I see that more and more other industries are committing to work uh, crossover, and I think that's why it's so important when you get this science in front of you, and then you call for action. And, and I think that this is a historical moment uh, in, in this century. Uh, we're going to have a lot of decisions, and for me and for Ericsson, this is extremely important, and I will see that all other industry players in my industry will reach out and see what we can do to reduce the CO2 emission. But we clearly believe we can reduce it up to 20% already 2020 mm -hmm. by using the technology. Thank you very much. Hmm. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Lambertini, you launched the Living Planet Report. Um, and uh, why don't you share with us the key findings from that and add your perspective uh, from the civil society to this conversation? Thank you very much. So for, uh, we, I'll be very brief. My role here is, is to say very few things. First of all, that we are completely aligned uh, with the uh, planetary boundaries concept. In fact, more than that, uh, the concept has really, is really the foundation uh, of our uh, strategy in, in dealing with the uh, um, reaching development within uh, the limits of the planet. Um, our Living Planet Report, as you just uh, cited, is also painting a very uh, dramatic picture of the uh, impact uh, on the environment. Um, uh, we are using a number of indicators. One particularly striking is the uh, collapse of wildlife populations around the world. 40% uh, of the populations of wildlife, vertebrate wildlife has been lost in the last 40 years. Um, that is symptomatic, highly symptomatic, of the impact we're having on uh, uh, ecosystems. Uh, but on the other hand, I also have to stress the fact that we really feel, I really feel, we all in WBF feel, this is really beginning to be exciting times. Because on one hand, the state of the uh, environment, the state of the planet is deteriorating, it's clear. On the other hand, uh, uh, the uh, pressures are diversifying, intensifying sometimes, and, and for sure becoming more and more complex. But what is really exciting is uh, uh, the response is also on the app. And, uh, and the integration, the integrated thinking about it, and the clarity of science. Um, the publications Johan was referring before are doing two important things uh, to, to all of us. First, are actually moving us beyond the denial. Uh, mm. <laughs> um, Science is clear. Science is telling us very clearly that human development is at the expense of the environment, and it cannot go on this way. Um, the other exciting thing uh, in a change program, because I think we are really in the middle of a change program as, as a civilization, uh, is to have this problem statement very clear, to have the challenge very clear, which has to be need, uh, meeting the needs of a growing and increasingly prosperous, uh, we want, uh, population uh, on the planet uh, um, uh, within the boundaries of, the, of, 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 of Earth, uh, but particularly the really, really exciting part, which is actually demonstrated in Davos through the WEF program, is that we are now combining social, economic, and environment. We are really beginning to think that there is no way we can deal with the three key pillars in isolation. And somebody mentioned the SDGs, uh, the Sustainable Development Goals discussion. I mean, this morning at the Water Forum, uh, uh, the, the, you know, Amina, um, the, the, one of the leaders of the SDG process, referred to, waters, to water, the water challenge and cited the three key pillars to deal with, sanitation, access, and environment. Everything is coming together. I think we've, we've got that now, and this integrated approach is the only way uh, forward, and this year, uh, consolidating that into uh, a global agreement on climate and uh, development will be, I think, an historical uh, achievement that we all here definitely are striving to, mm. to make, make, uh, make come through. Thank you. Um, I'm um, sorry to say that Mr. Eliasson has to leave us for his next assignment. 
um, five minutes. In five minutes. Oh, that's a that's a great All opportunity. The to him so then. let's open the floor quickly to questions. Um, please, we have a microphone. For the sake of our online audience, please state your organization and name. Thank you. I have a question for Mr. Liasson uh, on on the international cooperation. There, how, how can the UN unite more with with NGOs and uh, the science world? <coughs> Well, I, I think we are uh, we are on the way to 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 a complete shift of uh, thinking. Uh, we cannot do it alone. We we need to have a complete mobilization this time. I had a meeting with ambassadors in New York just uh, before I left on the SDG process and the Paris uh, process and. Normally, diplomats would say, well, first we have to negotiate the end of uh, the, the, uh, the process by September, then we can start communication. They said, no, we have to start now. We have to get these issues out there because we are in a hurry and we need to prepare opinion. And once these goals are, are launched in the end of September, then we are off, up and going. And, and therefore, I think it's very good that we, we work in these combinations. I think we should, as I said, put the problem in the center. And mm. civil society and NGOs are an absolute <coughs> crucial factor. And I also want to, uh, to, to build on what you said. Here we have two fantastic photographers, Matthias Klum and Jeppe Wikström. You should see their pictures. Uh, I, I have been a great admirer of what you're doing. They can play a very important role. One thing I've learned from my job as emergency relief coordinator and uh, also negotiator in conflicts is that the images, the images are extremely powerful. Uh, I don't think we should need any more convincing about the science, as we all agree here. <laughs> mm. But when we see these pictures, uh, there is no doubt, there is no hesitation. And if we can combine now the uh, scientific evidence and uh, present it in such a living uh, way as Johan and his colleagues are doing, and with the help of World Wildlife Fund and, and your work and your colleagues in other organizations all over, and with private sector realizing that this is in the interest also of business, that we have a, a world that is, is sound and safe. It's in the light and self-interest. It's part of your, Hans and I have talked about that. This is part of his strategic plan yeah. to make sure that he follows these issues. Mm. That's why we tied him to us in the broadband, uh, on the broadband issues. Mm. And uh, that's why it's so good that you bring us together here, the World Economic Forum. So uh, I just want to thank you, and by this I will leave this room uh, and uh, look forward to seeing you in different combinations here in the next two days. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So, gentleman in the middle. Uh, and how can businesses adopt a planetary boundaries framework? I think that. Uh, the framework, of course, is very important for us, as I said. I mean, partly the business that we are conducting as an industry and as Ericsson, we are, we are building an enabler to actually work with the, uh, these planetary boundaries. And then, of course, that's the broadband that is rolling out all around the world. Uh, as I said in previous discussions, we will end up 2020 with uh, 1.7 billion people not having broadband, but it's only 300 million that doesn't have coverage. We just need to see that they are accessible because that means also that we can start transforming and you doing a sustainable planet much easier because the technology can then uh, it make more efficiency. We, we, we use our global resources in a much better way. So I think that uh, when it comes to business using these type of frameworks, it's important to understand if it's connect, connected to business and sustainability, it's going to happen. And this is where I'm coming from. This is business for us. At the same time, it's impacting very good or very important social issues in our, in our society. And that's how I see we are working with this. And that's why we, as an organization in the Broadband Commission, for example, bringing together different stakeholders from our industry, gathering together what can we do in order to fight this. And that could be on healthcare, it could be on CO2 emissions, or it could be on education. But we have a framework work and we want to reach out with them. That's how we work. Just a quick follow-up on that. So this 20% emissions by 2020, yep. what's going to stop is, is that across business or is that everywhere? And, but, and what's going to stop it or what's going to create the, the transformation? The scaling of happen? solutions is the biggest challenge we have. Of course, connected cars, making manage, uh, management of traffic is one very important, and connectivity of cars is starting to happen. Uh, 
what we have seen now, think about this. I mean, we talk about connected devices and everything, and that's great. We talked about 50 billion connected devices 2010. What we are thinking about right now, when you connect those devices, they create a system. That system can impact our society. A very good example is great to have a connected car. Um, you're going to have information, health of the car. You can drive better. But when you can connect all the cars, you have a transport systems. The transport system can definitely avoid CO2 emission by steering traffic better, giving the right signals to people uh, and, and steering it. So one need to think that different industries will go from connecting one thing to connecting the system. Power grids is another thing that, of course, when that's get a smart grid, you start with connecting the meters, then you have the whole system, and then you can start uh, steering the electricity, then you can reduce the waste of electricity. All of that will be enabled by the technology. So the technology is only an enabler. There has to be partnership with energy companies, with transport companies. We cannot do it alone. But we can provide the platform, and we have good visibility how far this platform will go. And it will go extremely <coughs> far. I mean, 96% of the Earth's population will have mobile coverage by 2020. It's the fastest technology rollout in the world. It's one of the biggest transformative technologies that we have in the hands of all people on Earth in 2020. And I, my work together with my colleagues is to see that those are reflecting in the SDGs. And one of the challenges in the SDGs is, of course, the climate change. Yeah. So that's where I come from. Thank you. So mindful of the schedule of everyone and of the time, uh, I would close this press conference here. Uh, One clarification? Please. Yes, yeah. yeah, so just, just on a practical issue, just to explain that. So three days back, <clears throat> we published two scientific articles which give the support for the dialogue we've had here. One is on the Great Acceleration, which is the latest update on the human pressures on the planet, which is empirical observations on the exponential rise of pressures. And the same day, in science, we published the five-year update on the planetary boundary research. Now, that was published Friday. And, I, and I'd like to just share with you that uh, science, which is the world's most prestigious science scientific magazine, has a paywall for all its publications. But the interest was so large that they've actually opened it up for open access in order to really put this out in the common domain. What happens tomorrow is that uh, we have an event outside of, of the WEF Congress where we launched the book, which summarizes all the science with photographer Matthias Klum and tells the story that Marco is portraying, that using planetary boundaries is not a way to hamper development. It is rather a way to put the incentives in place to, to guide the kind of incentives and innovations that, that Hans is talking about. So it's about a transformation into abundance within a safe operating space. It's not limits to growth. It's growth within limits. Mm. And I think that is a very different story, which we now have tremendous amount of scientific empirical evidence in support for. Very good. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody.